Afternoon guys, Dr. Ken Nordberg here, <laughs> again, I'm at a deer hunting seminar. You know, I've been getting letters, emails lately, and responses to some of my uh, YouTube seminars from people who are going to be tenting for the first time in their deer country this year. And, uh, you know, all the precautions we, my sons and I have learned to take over the years, so it's kind of, it's kind of routine for us, you know, and, uh, and we've never had a serious problem. Oh, once when uh, using catalytic heaters, and uh, we used some years ago, and woke up one evening and the tent was filled up with an acrid odor that made it almost impossible to breathe. It was just horrifying. And uh, they got the sleeping bag on top of one of those catalytic heaters and oh that was awful and there was another time we had it wasn't a scare but some things I wanted to talk about if, if you're going to be doing this for the first time this year and using uh, say a wood stove like we use in our big tents for heating and I tell you something now, to me a wood stove in my main tent is one of my joys in life <laughs> during hunting seasons. But I love the solemn. I grew up in, I grew up as a kid uh, in a home that I w did all his heating with wood. Wood for the kitchen, uh, cook stove and wood in, uh, wood burning stoves in the house, keep the house warm. I always thought this, the mewing and snapping and crackling of a wood fire was something really Really neat. I, I always loved the sound of a wood fire. And uh, sitting in that tent, nice and warm, you know, it can be 20 below outside, and nice and warm in the tent, and, and bare feet, you know. You can walk around. We, we have inside outside carpeting in our tents and walk around on that, no matter how cold it is outside, and not be cold, be comfortable. Well, it took some years for us to arrive at the point where, you know, we do, we do this routinely without hardly thinking about it anymore, but there are some things to watch out for, and so I decided I should tell you all about uh, things to watch out for if you're going to be heating with wood for the first time. First of all, start out with the right kind of wood, you know. Uh, we we cut down standing dead evergreens, that's spruce and balsam and pines, or jack pine and white pine, but they're dead trees, no more greenery on them. Now, just because a deciduous tree that drops its leaves doesn't have leaves on it, that doesn't mean it's dead. You know, you got to be careful about it. We, we burn a lot of of what we call here in Minnesota popple trees, a better known name for them is quaking aspen. And that white wood in their, in their trunks when they're dead is wonderful wood. Uh, it burns clean, it provides lots of heat, but if it isn't quite dried out, you know, maybe lightning hit the tree last June or something and and knocked, and the top of our tree fell off, and, and that, here's this nice straight trunk and hardly any branches on it. So nice to split, easy, you know. But if it's wet, it still has a lot of sap in the wood. That can be just a, such a disappointing wood. That, you, you know, you, it takes more to get the fire going, and once it gets going, and a lot of all this moisture come out of there. Uh, goes up the chimney and condenses in the cold uh, metal stovepipe outside, and they get water dripping down inside the inside the stovepipe, and and it hits a joint in the pipe, and it, and it start dripping. Uh, the reason I use a uh, configuration of stovepipes, uh, you know, you, if you saw one of my recent uh, 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 YouTube seminars uh, about tents tents we use, uh, you've seen that stovepipe consideration where the upright is four feet away from the side of the tent, almost four feet away, and so that none of that drip ends up on the tent. Uh, if you're in, particularly if you're using evergreens, uh, the kind of drip you'll get is black, 
and it looks terrible if it's falling on the side of your tent. So I want that final upright section of my stovepipe to be out away from the tent. And we use the, the, the idea that you, you'll see on that video. And it's held up there by three different ropes, three ropes going in three directions, one going right over the vestibule of the big tent to hold that thing up, and boy, that works good. And, you know, and it's, the thing is wired to a 15-foot ball, tall piece of, or a tree trunk, a spruce trunk that we've used for years now. Okay, here's my mark that I made right there, and that means the bottom of the stack has got to line up with that. Okay. Here's the next strange thing we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to attach that chimney to that pole. I don't know if that, if the fire or if the heat inside the stack ever gets hot enough to burn the pole, but I don't care. Uh, this is what I was taught by those Indians. You take, you put a wire around the pole. There we go. Wire around the pole. Like that. Then you got a can, a Campbell's soup can in this case. And you put the two ends of the wire through the can. Like that. And that can goes between the pole and the stack. Like that. You see? I'll put it up a little further here. And it keeps the pole from igniting, which I doubt it would do, but I wouldn't take a chance on it. You see how that works? And then you tie the wire tight around the pole and the stack, and that's can number one. We're going to put three in there. You don't have to watch me put in all three, but Sam put in the first one. And this part here lines up with my mark right there. Right there. That will be perfect. So that, that holds that thing steady, upright, no matter how windy it is outside. But it works good. But you notice that we put those pails on the elbows. Uh, you know, where that uh, two elbows are that come down the main stack and then goes over the tent and goes down. And we put those elbow, uh, little pails under those elbows because if there's any drip because of condensation in that upright, it ends up in the little pail. And I'll check it once or twice during the deer season. Uh, sometimes if you're burning wet wood, you know, uh, you can get, those pails can fill up pretty fast. So be aware of that. Yeah, you can get a lot of rain or snow maybe during the deer season, and you want to check those those little pails. Those are coffee cans with a wire bale on them, but uh, that's a good idea. Keep your tent looking nice and neat. So uh, now, so standing dead wood is best, and we always go up three days earlier, four days early, uh, and set up camp. And the big job is to find standing dead wood and cut the thing down, a tree down, and you better know what you're doing if you're taking on big trees. If you've never cut down big trees before, be careful. Maybe stick to smaller diameter trees to start with. Uh, but it can be dangerous, you know. Logging is not for the amateur. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, we cut those down, we cut them into lengths about, oh, 18, 20 inches lengths like that. And then we split them. We got big splitting malls. And we get two, three guys going, and boy, we can split a lot of wood in a hurry. And, and then we stack our wood carefully so it can air out, dry out more before we use it. If, if it's good wood, it'll be useful right from the south, nice and dry, standing dead wood. And uh, if you find that it's wet and it's kind of like sawdusty inside, it's soft and pulpy on there, don't use that kind of wood. It'll just give you a lot of smoke and no heat and a lot of trouble. So you want good wood in there, the solid wood for pieces. And big pieces, small, you can put, have some, maybe a quarter of your stump as a big piece. 
uh, for putting in there in the evening, and it'll last longer when you got big pieces. But you need thin pieces too for getting your fire going. Now, one of the things we do, and we stack, we stack, uh, we'll have a stack inside of it. Uh, you see a pile there, I've got a rack there, it makes it kind of nice to keep it a little bit neat in the tent. We got a pile of wood under, outside, just outside the door. That where I can stack about a third of what we're going to use during the hunting season inside, and then the rest we stack outside, and then I stack it on a tarp so the bottom pieces aren't soaking up moisture from the ground. And it's covered with a tarp on top and keep it dry. And it gives it a chance, but it's still loose enough around so it can dry out underneath that tarp. But we want to keep that wood dry for the entire hunting season, so keep that in mind. Now, uh, the other thing now, for starting a fire in your wood stove, and you kind of learn this in time, but when you're starting a wire in your, in your wood stove, we've learned that the best starter is charcoal lighter. You know, all the liquid wire. It's not real volatile, like say gasoline or stove gas or something like that. Uh, you can stack wood in there and, uh, and put, you know, we don't cram it to the top. Usually only about half the, of our, the chamber where we put the wood will pile up a piece of wood in there. And then get a bottle of that charcoal layer and you can spray the end of it real good and uh, get it started there. Make sure that all the ends get lit. And then uh, we'll put that down. Uh, you know, usually when we go to the deer camp, we have at least four of the biggest containers we can buy of, of charcoal lighter. You know, they're fairly good size. And that's usually enough for our, the entire deer season for us. And, but now, the thing about charcoal lighter, you can take a mat, take a match or whatever other, you know, lighter or whatever, and, and bring it up to the wood there without worrying it's going to be explosive, you know, and it isn't going to be that way if, as long as there isn't flames in there already. But you touch that on there, then close your door on your, on your uh, stove and open the, make sure the opening where the, the draws air into the stove for your burning wood is open fairly large and your damper on your, on your Pipe going up there is wide open, you know, vert uh, vertical. And when you light it up, you'll get a really strong flame right away. Boy, it whooshes like almost like a, like a, it'll start going and, and it'll be rattling the door and it sounds almost like a jet airplane, you know. But that strong flame you get, hot flame you get real quickly when you're using charcoal lighter. Hey, uh, it has several purposes, but number one is it helps start the fire quickly. You can get your tent warmed up quickly with that kind of thing. And uh, uh, and then as soon as the, you get some crackling going in there, you know, you can, but you know, at first you'll, you'll think, holy cow, this thing is just woo, woo, woo. It's really going like crazy. But that hot air that's produced by that first flame of the charcoal lighter, it, it can push the cold air. It, you know, your pipe's sitting there. Let's just say it's been all night, it's early morning. That pipe is cold, full of cold air. And cold air is heavy, heavier than warm air. And uh, in order to get your smoke going up that chimney, you want to get that whole smokestack emptied of cold air quickly. Uh, if you just Deal around and put a little bit of charcoal lighter on you got a little flame and you're waiting and waiting and waiting for this thing to turn into fire. That column of cold air in the chimney doesn't want to go out of there and you'll get a lot of smoke coming back into your tent. And you think, boy, this is terrible. <laughs> and it is. But with the, when you got a really hot flame right away like that, that hot air pushes that cold air right up out of the chimney. And it's wide open now for, you know, the heat that comes off there to keep and pull your smoke and go out the chimney top real quick. You aren't going to get a lot of smoke in the chimney. 
The other thing that's good about using charcoal lighter is that when you start your fires with that, you aren't going to have all kinds of sparks pulling out, pouring out of the chimney. I remember years ago we used newspaper, same newspaper, and bring it to your camp and use newspaper to, to start a fire. You bundle it all up and put it in there and put wood on top and all that. No, it's ready to go and light that newspaper. What you're going to get when you use newspaper is a lot of sparks. You're going to have pieces of paper that burning or glowing coming up out of the top of your chimney. Even, yeah, I use a 15 foot tall chimney, so it's way up there. When I, by that time, if there were anything with charcoal lighter, it's not going to be glowing or we'll have sparks coming out of the chimney anymore. Which can be dangerous in dry conditions. You could start a forest fire that way. You don't want that to happen. But with newspaper, well, you got all kinds of little pieces of newspaper coming out of your chimney that could settle on your tent or, uh, you know, on dry foliage around you, maybe start a fire. So that newspaper is not a good choice, or any kind of paper. Well, there's some lighter things around, you know, made of wax to put in there, but they're slower because they don't push that, that cold column of air out of your chimney quickly, like charcoal lighter will do. So that's what we use for, for that. Now, another thing is, you know, you got to, here you are in your nice tent, this canvas, and waterproof and all those kind of things now, and boy, you're thinking, this is really wonderful. But your stove, when you're using a wood stove, if you aren't careful, and even if you are careful, every once in a while it's going to get kind of hot in the tent, so oh, it's getting hot, you got to open the door and open a couple of windows to cool it down, and that, we do that every now and then in our camp, but that hot stove can damage your tent. I mean, it can, some of these fabrics nowadays, they, they'll just melt rather than burst into flame, but they can burst into flame as well. So you should always have some kind of a, a heat shelf between your stove and the tent canvas, like your stove here and the canvas on the other side. I actually, in that, my big two-barrel stove, it's made from water tanks, <laughs> but it's like an Alaskan type where they have two great big oil drums and make a stove out of that lot. Well, ours is smaller, smaller tanks, but just think, it can get pretty hot. And, it, and it, it, actually that lower unit, which is the burner and the upper part, the upper barrel is a heat converter that gets hot and there's more area putting heat into the area when you have a twin barrel than a single barrel. But anyway, it can get pretty doggone hot. And whereas it might not burn down your tent, you might melt your tent wall or damage it severely. So you should always have a heat shelf between your stove and that nearest canvas. We actually put in two. Uh, we have a metal one that, uh, that reflects heat back into the tent in there. And then behind it, one of these uh, mat kind of things you can buy at most hardware stores that are heat shelves for wood stoves. And uh, with my two-barrel stove, I've got to have a big one that goes up as high as the stove itself. And uh, so, it, we, that, you know, in, in the evening, you might as well see the bottom stove is glowing red. That's not, you think, boy, that's hot there. You don't want that on your tent wall or under it. Now, we also have a heat shell we put on the ground or on the floor of the tent. Now, th there's a zipper hole for our stove, but it isn't near enough big enough for my two-barrel stove, and so, but we have a heat shell we put down and the stove goes on top of that, so we have a heat shell on the bottom and a heat shell behind, okay? Well, meanwhile, you know, you might put it, we make clothes racks out of um, dead timber, you know, four legs on the piece going across and bracing on there and nails on there, so can hang all kinds of hunting clothes and camp clothes on that rack there, close to the stove. Well, there have been times when I've noticed, gee, uh, somebody's gloves over there, or somebody's sleeve over there is starting to smoke. <laughs> it's that hot. So be careful about where you place things that might be flammable around your windstone. 
I mean, that, that's just common sense. Everybody should know that. So uh, keep them well away from them uh, so that you don't start your, your valuable hunting clothing on fire. But, so then the next thing, uh, if you're doing this for the first time, you got all these nice new metal stovepipes, say six inches, you know, they're going up, going through a hole on the road for the one side of the tent, going outside and going up. Uh, the first time you use them, those stovepipes <laughs> can, it, it can emit the most awful odor, and a choking, coughing, stinging eye and stuff. Well, I remember the first time, I, I, my first stove was a, uh, what was called an airtight stove. They're made up in Canada. They're small stoves, and and they were great. But boy, you got to be putting wood in them all the time. My bigger stove, I don't have to add wood as often, and I can regulate how fast it's going to be burning wood by uh, adjusting the amount of air going in the door. You know, it's an adjustable kind of thing. So uh, don't uh, the the more you close up the vents that go to the fire on the bottom the slower the fire is going to burn. And the same way with the damper up in the chimney, you should have a damper on there every time. So if it's starting to get too hot in there, you've got to be able to control that. You can close that damper. It, does, it never completely closes, but you're going to close it down so that air isn't rushing up that, that chimney of yours. And uh, so uh, uh, you can regulate how much, how fast the wood is being burning and what the temperature is in the tent by regulating that the vents going into the stove and your damper. And it's wide open on both uh, both of those. When you start the fire, but as soon as it gets going, it's warm in the tent, you got to adjust the, the, the vents in the front, close, start closing them down, and and also on the chimney. You have to turn that damper so it's a little more open or half open or wide open or whatever you need. But you got to adjust these things when that, once the fire gets going. At night we close them down, not all the way, but we, we, we get into bed. We're all in minus 20 sleeping bags. and uh, So we don't really need fire at night to be comfortable in our camp. Well, you know, uh, get back and that smell from the pipe, you know, so be prepared for that first time you light up a wood fire stove. Uh, you might, now it doesn't happen, some pipes I've bought recently didn't have that happen, they were just fine. Uh, but I remember the first time I put a fire on my airtight that I had from Canada in the tent, and those pipes started getting, holy man, was that an awful smell. We had to quick open doors on both sides ends of the tent and windows and get outside and wait a while until whatever it was bur finally burned off. And then after that happens, you won't have that problem anymore. So um, now one other thing, you know, on top of my 15 foot, uh, you know, top of my stove stack, it ends up 15 feet high, way up there, and uh, it's held up there with tin cans in between some some Indians that I had for guides up in Ontario when we were for moose hunting uh, showed me how they do it and it was such a good idea I've been doing it ever since and we, we cut the ends off of tin cans both ends and you lay this down on the ground when you you set you tie the, the the pipe to the upright and uh, if we mark that uh, we get the pipe coming out of the tent, and then here's an elbow where it's going to go straight up. We'll, we'll uh, take that pole we're using and put it up there, and, and we want that pipe that's going to go in there, it's going to go in the top uh, at this level, we'll mark that spot on that, on that pole. Now, the next thing we need is a tall log like this one. <laughs> it's going to support the stovepipe and we want a tall stovepipe. And the reason we want a tall has two reasons. One is you get it up well above the tent you aren't going to have smoke coming from the end of the stovepipe into the tent. And the other is even more important. Uh, you want a tall because you don't want sparks coming from the stove 
and coming out of the end of the stovepipe and settling on your tent roof. You're going to have to be full of holes up there before you know it if, you, if the stovepipe is too short. You want a good distance there. Uh, now you can, one of the things we learned over the years, never start a fire in your stove with newspaper. Uh, newspaper will, pieces that big will go right up the chimney burning and could settle on your tent and start your tent on fire. You get a lot of sparks from newspaper. We use charcoal lighter. Put charcoal lighter on the wood, you get no sparks from the charcoal lighter. And it burns intently. And what that does, when you get a good intense flame right away, it forces air to go whizzing up the chimney. If you didn't do that, when you start the fire, cold air column in the, in the stovepipe will keep the smoke from going up and out. And the smoke will want to come into the tent. So we use the charcoal lighter that gives you a good intense flame to start with. Uh, you get a really quick movement of that cold column of air out the chimney. All your smoke goes out the chimney and there's no sparks. So this is a good way to do it. But that stovepipe needs good support. And we got to start with a pole like this. And well, the first thing I guess we better do is dig a little hole here at the bottom because we don't want this pole to move around. Okay. Well, we dug the little hole here for the base of the pole here. You got to do that before you mark it for the for the chimney height. And it's kind of important to mark the pole because you we know, have all kinds of problems. A lot of nasty words being spoken when things don't line up properly here. Now the stovepipe, the bottom of the stovepipe is going to end up right about here. There, that's well marked. Okay, now we'll take the pole down and we're going to attach the stovepipe with the pole laying flat on the ground. And then we can take the pole and lay it on the ground and we put these cans in between open cans and wire goes uh, uh, up over the stovepipe and then through a can and then around <laughs> that upright pole in this way. And that keeps the stovepipe oh that far away from the from the uh, uh, that pole that wooden pole that holds that stack and it never gets that hot that it ever starts burning or smoking that keeps the that hot stovepipe away from that pole. And then on top of the smoke stack we have what's called, what's called a china cap and it. Okay, here we have our three cans on the pole. They're all attached, ready to go up. Uh, we got a cap on top. All that does keep rain and snow out of the stovepipe. Uh, overnight it could snow enough up here to plug up that pipe in the morning. We don't want that to happen, so we put a cap on it. and uh, Kind of crude, but it works good. Uh, but there's our pipe. And uh, you can see this pipe has been used before. Actually, this pipe is probably, oh, I would say 15 years old now. Uh, given us a lot of good service, and it will again. It's a, a, a round circle kind of thing, you know, tapering a little bit all the way around, and it straps onto the top of the pole. Now, one thing to remember is um, you can adjust that up and down, but the distance between the china cap and the top of the stove, uh, uh, the smokestack, has to be at least that's space that you've got open there has got to be at least equal to the diameter of the stovepipe. In other words, if you've got a six inch stovepipe, you want the space between the china cap and the top of the stovepipe to be at least six inches, two, both ways. It'll be, you know, front and back, but you want to be that high. If you got it down like this, you're going to start having a lot of smoke backing into your tent from your wood stove. You're going to have a hard time with it. You want it up here. Now, you might be thinking, oh, gee, i got to put some screening on there so sparks don't get all over in the woods, and that's a great idea. But when you put screening on, you're going to start reducing the amount of, of uh, air that can get out of that stovepipe. If you put any kind of screening on, you've got to be much bigger than six inches. You've got to have a much bigger space than six inches between the top of the, the china cap and the top of your uh, standing pipe. 
or you're going to start having a lot of smoke in your tent. Now, if you're getting smoke in there, that's the probable reason you got that china cap on there too, too low, or that screening you put on is is closing off the airflow. Now, I haven't used any kind of screening around my stovepipe in 30 years, 30 some years. That's one reason I got a 15 foot pipe. It's really a long one. There's nothing, no sparks going to be coming out of it when you're way up there and you don't use newspaper to, to start your fire. Uh, so, anyway, um, so, but remember, you got to have that distance or you're going to have smoke in your tent. Now, then, you know, I mentioned we, we cut our wood and stack them. And it might take you a couple of days, two, three days. At first, your fire might be, unless you use some standing dead pine, maybe jack pine or something like that. It's got a lot of dead branches. Sometimes we'll take a lot of those dead branches to camp and, and stack them in a different place but, or break them up into small pieces and put them in a pail over there by where we got the wood snapping. That is such good firewood, you know. Those lower branches on evergreens are like gasoline almost for starting a fire. So we like to have kindling there, or at least a lot of real thin cut wood that we've split beforehand. But at first it might take two, three days, no matter how dead and how dry that wood seems before it really starts acting the way you'd like to act, you know. They put wood in there and put some Charcoal hanger spray and then start it up. And, well, okay, it's wireless. Shut down the the uh, the front of the door where the oxygen goes in to feed the fire and close it, the damper down, and pretty much forget it for maybe an hour or longer, even in some cases. And all comfortable in the oven, but you should in the tent. But <laughs> uh, but always, you should always be aware of what your stove is doing. You know, if you're getting glowing red metal on your stove, man, you better get that closed down quickly because uh, that could be bad. But anyway, when you got good flow like that and smoke going out, the uh, odds of being suffocated in your tent because of your fire are, are really not very great. But even so, every tent you use, whether you're using a wood stove or one of these new propane indoor safe type heaters that goes off if you tip it or the oxygen level gets low, well, no matter what kind you're using, you should have good uh, uh, flow of oxygen into the tent from outside. If you've got it all closed up tight and that canvas is wet, man, that's a water airtight in chamber that you're in. You want to have oxygen coming in at all times. So part of what you're, the wood you burn or the propane or whatever you're using to heat your tent, it, it's got to be sacrificed because you got to have airflow coming into that tent. Especially at night when you're sleeping and you're not, you know, aware of what's going on here. Well, we don't have any stoves running. You know, our wood burns out probably about one or two in the morning if the fire's getting low. When I get up in the morning, and I've always been the guy who starts it in the morning, uh, there, there's hardly any live sparks left in the stove when I get up in the morning, so I usually have to start from scratch there and get that fire going, get the place warmed up. Every, every, nobody else in the tent moves until it's warm. Oh, it's warm out there, and they come out of their sleeping bags then. And by that time, I've got my coffee going. And, and uh, so, anyway, uh, but. Those wood stoves are wonderful. I, you know, to me, it's always been one of the most peaceful things to sit there in front of that stove in the evening and maybe read a book, you know, before going to bed and and hear that hissing and popping and crackling and that fire in front of me. And I, I love that sound. Uh, to me, that is a is very definitely one of the things I love most about camping where I hunt whitetail. And if after you get to be really accustomed to, to using wood to heat your tent, you're going to feel the same way. That's half the fun here during having that tent nice and warm and a nice crackling fire before you in the evening. 
Boy, as a, in a crackling fire field, especially when you come in the evening, gee, it's cold in here, <laughs> you got to get a fire going. But now you know how to get a fire going quickly, and 15 minutes later it's nice and warm in there, and you can sit down, maybe have a cup of hot coffee, and dinner is warming up for the evening, you know, whatever you're going to eat that evening. And uh, such a satisfying, wonderful time, you know, to, to have a, a wood stove. Being your tent, we don't use wood stoves in our in our small tents. Our, the the smaller ones like you've seen in a recent YouTube uh, seminar, uh, the the our square teepees. <laughs> now, that bigger square teepee, that one is made for uh, heating with a wood stove. It's got a hole in the roof on one side that you can use to put a stove in and stack. But we've learned that. Uh, propane, a safe inside propane stove that gives you, you know, a third setting of 18,000 BTUs heats that tent very nicely, you know, nice and warm, comfy. Uh, during our last uh, scouting trip, we had zero degrees one then. And I have that kind of a propane stand we use and hooked up to a 20 pound uh, propane tank which under ordinary circumstances, if you're careful, is good for, well, it'll be all I need to keep warm in my tent when I'm in camp during the coming hunting season, one 20 gallon tank. But one thing about that too is I, I, I made an addition, I learned this last time, that tank ran out before I thought it would because we had been using it a lot more than we normally would when we're hunting. And I bought one, a pressure gauge to put on the tank and with that on there, I'll never run out again. I mean, if I, I'm only going to take three tanks up there this year, and one is for me in my small tent. But I'll keep an eye on the pressure gauge that I've added on there. And if it's, I'm getting down to the red zone, I, in the evening after coming in, I can take a run to town, 26 miles away, and get a fresh tank of propane. But I'll never run out again using that pressure gauge on that tank. And uh, it doesn't cost a lot of money, yeah, but that sure is a good idea. Rather than bringing extra and having it sitting around, maybe you never use it. Anyway, uh, that's a good idea. With that, I don't know what else to tell you about your firewood, but keep it dry and uh, stack it well. Don't just throw it in a pile. Uh, and, uh, and keep it covered while you're there in the, any stacks you put outside. Normally, uh, when we cut wood for that big tent, we want to end up with uh, our rack, our wood rack inside, full to the top, and uh, and outside uh, we want a stack that's five feet wide, five feet well, five feet square, five feet tall. You know, and if you haven't learned how to make stacks that go straight up on the sides, that's something that's a little skill you should learn. My, I learned that when I was a little kid. One of my jobs when I was a kid that cut firewood for the cook stove before I went to the bus stop to go to school in the morning. And, but anyway, we're cutting a little, actually a little more than a cord of wood. That stack is about half of a cord. Then the stuff that, that rack full inside is oh, maybe about a third of a cord. So not even that, it's about a sixth of a cord actually. And that's enough. Uh, if we were going to sit around there every day and burn wood all day and people in the tent all day, uh, you'd have to add quite a bit more to that. And so depending on your habits and what you want to do, uh, you, you might learn that, gee, I need a stack twice as big <laughs> outside the tent. So, but we've been doing this, we've been tent camping since, uh, for more than 40 years. And so we're good at it. We, we want to be comfortable when we're in deer camp. And we don't want to cut any more wood than we need. That's a lot of work. <laughs> so uh, we, we just uh, we cut about what we think we need. And every year um, we, almost, we come out almost to, the, to within a dozen pieces of, of, uh, of using up our wood. So, Well, with that, guys, uh, those of you who are using wood to heat your tent for the first time, I think this will help you to make sure things run well for you. But don't be disappointed. Hey, if you have problems at first and you feel like you're, 
this this sure is a lot of work or whatever. Uh, I think in the future there's going to be some bigger of these safe indoor type propane heaters. Uh, I, I saw an ad for one and I looked at that. Boy, that sounds like it'd be a nice thing. But boy, it was expensive. <laughs> but uh, uh, there's a possibility we might shift to that one one day, uh, something like that, and save ourselves the trouble of having to cut and split wood and stack wood and that kind of thing. But but I sure would miss that wood fire and beer camp if we do that. Well, guys, uh, with that, uh, I, I'm going to quit here. Uh, uh, good luck this year, and like my old buddy from Wisconsin, my old hunting buddy, always says, when anybody says good luck, he always says, shoot straight. Think about that one too, eh? Uh, shoot straight, and if you combine that with hunting in a way that Almost every buck you see is going to be standing or moving slowly within 50 yards. Why are you going to be a buck hunter? <laughs> you really are. You are going to be, you'll do better than me because you have more gear than I do. <laughs> more bucks than I have. Yeah, more bigger ones probably. We, we got big animals. That our big dominant bucks are commonly way over 300 pounds. I've got 305. Dress out about 247, something like that. So uh, we get big animals, but we don't get necessarily get to the hugest antlers in the country. But that's all right. We love where we hunt, and that's, that's good enough for us. So, yeah, I mean, they're nice bucks. You can put them on the wall, and everybody's, boy, is that ever a nice buck? Yeah, I can't stop. You know, I've, I've learned if I don't mention my book every time I do a seminar, all of a sudden we're not getting a lot of orders. So i got to sell my book. So, now, this business about the wood stove and wood and burning wood and all that kind of, you'll find lots of references in here about that as well. So, be sure to get your book. And, uh, uh, and from that, you know, everything is going to work out so much better for you in deer camp every year. The, the number of bucks you see, you know, other hunters never see, you know. And, uh, keeping comfortable up there no matter what the weather. And then we, we do our hunting uh, just uh, three miles from the Canadian border. And uh, we, we know what it's like to, hunt, to tent camp in really cold weather. We, John and I had zero degrees <laughs> the last time we scouted. Uh, and, uh, but we were comfortable. My dog, I, <laughs> my dog wasn't thinking it was so comfortable. He's getting old. I had to throw a blanket on them that <laughs> when, the, when the heat wasn't on. So anyway, uh, now before you before you leave me here, be sure to hit that subscribe button. I appreciate that and the thumbs up as well. So like I said before, good luck and shoot straight. <laughs> and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my eBooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.